Good morning and welcome to the August edition of the monthly Alabama Works webinar series. We're now going to turn it over to your host, Tim McCartney, Chair of the Alabama Workforce Council. Tim. Good morning, everyone. Uh, glad you're tuning in. Unfortunately, our Zoom is down, apparently all over the world. So that we're going to record the show this morning and post it later in the day. So uh, the content will be the same and uh, I think we'll be fine. So uh, thank you for joining us. And we're, we're happy to have two guests with us this morning, Commissioner Jane Elizabeth Bertishaw from the uh, Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services and Dr. Graham Sisson, who's the Governor's Office of D Disability Director. So I will uh, introduce them later into the uh, show. And uh, first though, I'd like to bring up uh, everyone to date on uh, some of the lab latest labor statistics we've gotten. Uh, as you know, we, we're almost five months into this COVID crisis we're having, and of course that has uh, negatively affected our employment in the state. But we, uh, as you know, the Labor Department tracks that very closely. So to give you the latest statistics, uh, as of August 21st, uh, the DOL announced that Alabama's July 2020 unemployment rate is 7.9 percent, which is 0.3 percent above the June 2020 rate of 7.6 percent, and it's a 5.1 percent increase over the July 2019 rate of 2.8 percent. Alabama's labor force participation rate, which is the number of Alabamians aged between 16 and 64 who are working or are looking for work, our rate was 57.5 percent which is an increase of 0.9% from the June 2020 rate of 56.6%. Total employment in Alabama for February of 2020 was 2,075,000. Between March 21st and August 15th, 735,801 Alabamians filed an initial unemployment claim, which of course is far greater than the 500,000 additional credential workers who need to be added to Alabama's workforce by 2025 in order to achieve Governor Ivey's post-secondary education attainment goal. Total employment in Alabama has decreased by 35.48% between February 29 and August 15th of this year. The largest decline occurred within the administrative support, waste management and remediation services sector which is a decline rate of 49.27%. The next largest decline occurred within the accommodations and food service industry at a rate of 45.07%. The third largest decline was in educational services at a declining rate of 41.91%. Next was arts, entertainment, and recreation at 41.11%. And uh, last was manufacturing, which decreased 37.14%. So we're gonna talk more on that uh, later on, but uh, our next uh, next part of the show, we'll, I'm gonna turn it over to Commissioner Jane Elizabeth Bertishaw from the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. Commissioner Bertishaw was appointed to the Commissioner of the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services by the Alabama Board of Rehabilitation Services in 2016. She has dedicated her entire career to enabling Alabama's children and adults with disabilities to achieve their maximum potential. Joining her will be Dr. Graham Sisson, who's the Executive Director of the Governor's Office on Disability. Dr. Sisson is uh, he's a graduate of the University of North Alabama, he also holds a law degree from Vanderbilt Law School, and he's a licensed attorney. And he also has his PhD in rehabilitation, counseling, and leadership from Auburn University. So without further ado, I'll turn the program over uh, to Commissioner Bergeshaw. Good morning. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, Dr. Sisson and I will, uh, instead of just going one after the other, we're going to kind of tag team on this PowerPoint. 
uh, and share a lot of information with you today. So first, let me um, share my screen. Okay, so we've already been introduced. We've got about uh, 80 slides. We're gonna fly through these. Uh, we're gonna cover um, quite a bit of information and we'll save questions at the end, uh, for the end. Uh, and since we're recording this, I guess we'll just take those through email or chat uh, when you watch the video and then we can get back in touch with you and answer those questions later. Uh, our contact information is on this first slide. So if you have questions, uh, please feel free to reach out directly to us at those phone numbers uh, or our email uh, with the rehab.alabama.gov. First of all, I just want to um, say that uh, our goal today is to help you learn more about expanding access and awareness for people with disabilities, whether they be physical or mental. And we're going to do that by talking a little bit about um, the law and, and what it means to give access. But we're also going to give some examples. We're going to have some fun video at the end, uh, give you some um, <laughs> uh, comic relief here on a Monday morning. Uh, but the main point that we want to do is help you learn how to serve your customers or job applicants or employees uh, with disabilities equally to those who do not have a disability. And we wanna do this through helping you understand more about universal access and equal opportunity and access. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the ADA basics. For those of you who don't know, that's the Americans with Disabilities Act. It actually uh, just had its 30th anniversary in July. And that is the premier civil rights legislation for individuals with disabilities. We're going to talk about the definition of disability, what associative uh, discrimination looks like. Uh, we're going to talk to you about Title II, Section 504, and the obligations under that title. We're going to talk to you about employment uh, duties. We're going to talk to you about reasonable accommodation, which is sometimes the most scary for, for employers, but we want to help you understand more about that. We wanna help you know when it's okay to ask about disability. And we want to teach you about public access under Title II and Title III. We're also gonna to talk to you about Section 188, which is under the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which governs, governs all of the labor partners, uh, labor, commerce, uh, workforce partners, excuse me, labor, commerce, rehabilitation, community colleges, and, and the rest. Uh, we also just want to give you some disability awareness. What is basic etiquette when it comes to disability? What is people first language? When us in the rehab world talk about people first language, we'll help you know what that means. And we also want to talk to you about myths and facts about disability. Please understand that all the information, although Dr. Sisson is an attorney, is uh, non-binding and does not constitute legal advice. Uh, we are available to provide further information and consultation to you. We're gonna give you the Reader's Digest version of all of this. There will be some crossover between the ADA Section 504 and Section 188 of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, and we'll cover physical and program access. So just so you know, the Career Centers uh, obviously house um, several of the workforce partners. We are just one of those workforce partners with vocational rehabilitation housed in the Career Centers. We've done some work with career centers in the past. This is just kind of a laundry list of some of those partnerships. In 2005, we worked on the MAPS program. Uh, 2011, we believe it was around that year, we did the Navigators program. 2015 to 2018, we had an ADRS access team led by Dr. Sisson who worked with the career centers and uh, developed a survey for the Department of Labor for those career centers about program access and they completed a checklist. We learned more about what they needed to update in those centers to make them accessible. And we gave each center action items that they needed to work on. Dr. Susan's had some sound effects, so. <laughs> Let's keep it going. <laughs> All right, so ADA basics, there are five titles in the Americans with Disabilities Act, and we're gonna to touch briefly on some of those, but Title I has to do with employment, Title II, public services, Title III, private business, Title IV, telecommunications, and Title V, miscellaneous. And I believe I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, uh, thank you, Commissioner Burshaw. Uh, this is uh, Graham Sisson, glad to be here this morning. Uh, quickly go over the uh, 
the definition of disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And you know, you have to have to be covered under the uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the ADA Amendments Act and the Rehabilitation Act, Section 504. Each one of those have the same definition of disability. It's a three part definition. You can meet any one of these parts and have disability. The uh, first one is the, what you most commonly think of as a disability, a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity, a record of impairment, or being regarded as having an impairment. And each of these is very broad, as you can see, it covers a lot of people with, this, with different types of conditions, both mental and physical. Then, of course, uh, association with disability. These are folks that don't actually have a disability, but they have an association with persons with disability. They're protected from discrimination based on that association. So parents of children with disabilities, uh, uh, relatives of people with disabilities, those uh, business partners, people with disabilities, those are examples of association. Uh, the next slide is the ADA Amendments Act. It was passed uh, in 2008, and it clarified the definition of disability. It restored the definition that the United States Supreme Court had narrowed by providing that corrective or mitigating measures could not be considered in determining if an individual has a disability, except for uh, corrective lenses uh, or eyeglasses. The uh, next slide, under the ADA Amendments Act, the types of corrective measure you can't consider in terms of somebody has a disability is medication, uh, assistive devices, or behavior modification. So then you can't consider eyeglasses and contacts. So mitigating or corrective measures are important, but a person cannot uh, be denied a disability status because they use these successfully. Next slide. Associate discrimination, as I mentioned, prohibits discrimination against people who associate with people who have disabilities. And I gave the example of parents and business partners and also friends. Another sound effect for you there. Okay, the, uh, the uh, ADA and Rehab Act requirements, uh, both the ADA and the Rehabilitation Act require that programs of public entities such as the career centers be accessible to people with disabilities. We abbreviated people with disabilities as PWD. Program access is more than just physical access. People understand accessible parking spaces, wider front door, accessible bathroom, but also means access to programs, activities, services. Program access applies only to areas open to the general public. In other words, employee only areas would not be covered on program access. It can also be provided through alternative methods. This is a change in practice to accommodate people with disabilities or relocation of service to an accessible area. So if you had uh, one part of the building that was not accessible, you could relocate classes from one inaccessible part of the building to another part of the building, or you could relocate it to an entirely different building. And this applies to buildings that were constructed before the Americans with Disabilities Act became law. Next slide. And of course, websites. This is the websites are now a major area where information is shared. They're considered a program or service covered by Title II, which applies to state and local governments and career centers. They should be accessible to people with disabilities. The standard is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0. They should be designed for screen readers. Somebody who's blind cannot see the screen. There's software that will read the screen for them, but it has to be in the right format for this to occur. And then there's also Section 508.gov. The 508 standards under that, on the access of board website, www.accessboard.gov. And also there's another website that I'd give you there, www.w3.org, which is another, where you can access these standards for making your website accessible. In the next slide, also we, we were talking about the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act. Each career center is a service operated by partnership of public entities covered by Title II and Section 504. Section 504 applies because there's federal money involved. The career center system should anticipate the needs of people with disabilities and the physical design of centers and the design of services. Many people say, well, we didn't see anybody with a, a person with a disability at the center. It's kind of like Field of Dreams, build it and they will come. 
And of course, and then you have the uh, facility access requirements as opposed to the program access requirements. New constructions and alterations and renovations are, should meet the highest standards under the ADA. Uh, existing buildings, uh, I mentioned about program access, being able to relocate service and providing alternatives. In new construction, they should be totally accessible. Uh, historical buildings, you're not required to make any change that would destroy an historically significant feature of the building. I'm not aware of any of our career centers, but if you're an employer and you're housed in a historical building, certain things would not have to be accessible where its historical significance is implicated. And there is no grandfathering. So we say, we've been around a lot longer than the ADA, we're grandfathered. It's just a different standard that applies depending on the age of the facility. All right. Uh, the 2010 accessible design. Let me get these on the oh, screen. I'm, <laughs> I'm going as quick as I can. No, we're good. <laughs> the 2010 accessible design standards. These are the ADA accessibility guidelines. They are the basis for the standards listed in the physical access checklist, which we can make available to you. The ADA hotline office can assist you with getting a copy of these standards. For example, van accessible park spaces should be eight feet wide with an eight feet wide access aisle or 11 feet wide with a five feet wide access aisle. These type of dimensions are listed in the 2010 accessible design standards. Back to you. All right, let's talk for a minute about employee rights and employer responsibilities. Under Title I of the ADA, um, it covers employers with 15 or more employees. And it only covers people with disabilities who can perform the essential functions of a job with or without reasonable accommodation. So when we talk about hiring individuals with disabilities, a lot of people uh, have a misconception that we're asking them to hire someone who is not qualified for the position. That's not the case. We are asking you to consider individuals who can perform those functions, who qualify for the position, and otherwise can complete the task of that job with or without reasonable accommodation. A covered employer is required to reasonably accommodate a person with a disability uh, who are current employees or job applicants, unless to do so would impose undue hardship. So what does that mean? Undue hardship is an action that causes a significant difficulty or expense for an employer. Um, and some employers, you know, they, they, they um, like to overuse undue hardship um, when things are, you know, relatively inexpensive. And just so you know, from coming from a rehabilitation background, Dr. Sisson and I can tell you that many reasonable accommodations require little to no cost to implement. Employers are not required to hire a person with a disability who is a direct threat to themselves or others unless a reasonable accommodation would reduce that risk. A reasonable accommodation must be effective for the job and benefits. And Dr. Sisson and I talked about this in the wording there. Uh, means that if you have, for instance, a lunch area for employees, and that's a fringe benefit that they get to go and enjoy lunch in your facility, you would want to make sure that that area is also accessible to a person with a disability. It applies to barrier removal related to disability. It does not include personal use items. We have that issue a lot at Rehabilitation Services because we hire a lot of individuals with disabilities. For instance, if someone needs hearing aids, that would be considered a personal use item and the employer, we as the employer, would not purchase that item for the employee. However, if someone needed their desk modified, we would pay for that accommodation. It may go beyond requirements of the ADA. Nothing stops you as an employer from going above and beyond what an employee asked for reasonable accommodation. In general, accommodation is any change to a work environment or in the way you do things uh, and customarily uh, enables an individual to do with a disability to um, participate in work and have equal access. 
types of reasonable accommodations. Um, we got a list here, we'll just go through them. Uh, we can make a facility accessible, modify written examinations or training, adopt flexible company policies, modify a work site, adjust a work schedule, acquire or modify equipment and devices, provide readers and interpreters, restructure job tasks, reassign a person to a vacant position, and this includes assignment to light duty where it already exists. Uh, just an example, for instance, if someone um, requires uh, treatment of some kind outside of employment, uh, or they need a private uh, workspace to um, you know, administer a treatment during the day, you might modify their work schedule so to give them the opportunity to be able to do that. Okay, during interviews or the application process, you may not ask specific questions about a disability or questions that would elicit uh, a response about disability. Employers may ask about disability after and only after a conditional offer of employment has been made. But such information should be kept confidential, typically in a separate file in your HR section and any reason for exclusion on the basis of disability must be job related and consistent with business necessity. Someone, uh, sometimes uh, I, I'm gonna guess that some of our workforce partners on the Workforce Council are federal contractors. And so, um, you know, can you ever ask about disability? And you can inquire, but such questions should be narrow in scope and ask in private to main confidentiality to maintain confidentiality of information and to be safe you should just ask everyone in a private and confidential way um, any questions um, that may be considered sensitive so that uh, others would not overhear um, those responses and, and many, you want to uh, jump in and many employers will use where they have to keep track of the numbers of employees with disabilities they'll use a voluntary disclosure of disability form the person doesn't have to fill it out and the information kept confidential. All right, the um, program access um, is the, uh, is the, um, all right, um, measuring accessibility in the, in the following uh, areas, um, computer workstations, um, disability awareness and ADA training, alternative formats, these are ways that you can provide accessibility also. Reasonable accommodations slash modification policies. These were similar, you know, to some of the accommodations in employment setting. Uh, auxiliary aids and services are interpreted. Auxiliary aid services are basically accommodations that facilitate effective communication with blind persons or deaf persons or people with speech impairments. And of course, emergency evacuation could, should be considered it is a program that you should involve people with disabilities and make sure that it meets their needs as well. And of course, non-discrimination and equal access policies and accessible parking enforcement policy. We know a lot of people like to park in those, uh, those big wide spaces closer to the door. If you don't have a policy to enforce that, to only make, to make sure that only people who need them have access to them, then you're not providing program access to those. And then of course, uh, marketing materials, you wanna make sure the availability on alternative formats from requests. Uh, if you have brochures and stuff, and you have on the brochure, will be provided in Braille upon request. Well, somebody who's blind can't read it to see that Braille. So you wanna get that out in some other form. Of course, equal employment opportunity language, that you're an equal opportunity employer, you don't discriminate on the basis of race, sex, national origin or disability in employment or the provision of programs and services. And again, auxiliary aid services upon request, that should be in all marked materials. And then the uh, text telephone or te te telecommunication device for the deaf number should be on there. And nowadays, you can also reference video relay services. And of course, uh, disability disclosure, um, Self-disclosure at application, we mentioned that before, voluntary disclosure disability form. And there's barriers to disclosure. 
Many times people don't want to, they're afraid of a fear of discrimination, particularly if they have a hidden disability with a stigma attached to it. And there's a fear of being perceived as incapable if they have a disability, a fear of delay in receiving unemployment compensation benefits if they disclose. So it's very important to understand these reasons. Uh, also, more information on disability disclosure. Staff work with individual disabilities must obtain permission from the individual before disclosing information about his or her disability with others. Sometimes there's a need to know if there's an emergency situation or if there's a need, somebody requesting accommodation where the, accommod where the disability is invisible will need to provide documentation about the disability in order to obtain reasonable accommodation. All discussions between staff and customers should, must be conducted in a manner that ensures the pre preservation of confidentiality. So ADA has requirements around confidentiality and we know that HIPAA also has confidence, confidential requirements. Uh, confidentiality, information about disability must be uh, kept confidential. That means keeping the information password protected on a computer and in separate files. And you use a private office space to discuss disability. You don't discuss it out in the hallway or in a cubicle without a door. And have a sign release before information, you obtain information on disability. And I mentioned about locked file cabinets with any disability related information. Separate files, separate from the personnel file. Password protected files on the computer and then there's a need to know, only share with employees with a business related reason to know. That's gonna be, that's usually the supervisor and the head of the agency. Okay, and then of course the uh, section uh, 188 overview, section 188 of the Workforce Investment Act of 1988, and also now the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act prohibits discrimination against individuals who apply to participate in, work for, or come into contact with programs, activities that receive federal financial assistance from the DOL or in a certain circumstance from other federal agency or otherwise part of the, of the Career Center Delivery System or America's Job Center. And Section 188, the whole purpose is to ensure universal access and equal opportunity for individuals with disabilities in the workforce development system, very broad. More information about Section 188. Section 188 prohibits discrimination on the grounds of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability. Today, we're emphasizing disability or political affiliation or belief, among other areas. Section 188, 188 also requires reasonable accommodation be provided to qualified individuals with disabilities in certain circumstances. In Commissioner Birdshaw has already described to you what a qualified individual with disability is. Next slide. Um, Section 188 overview, some more information. On July 22, 2014, the President signed the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, which I've mentioned. In general, WIOA takes effect or took effect in July 2015, and it supersedes the Workforce uh, Investment Act. And um, Section 188 of WIOA states provisions identical to those in Section 188 of WIA. This was the beauty of it. So you knew it under WIA, you also know, know it under WIOA. Uh, so, and of course, uh, more information on Section 188. Equal opportunity includes applying non-discrimination provisions, and that's what we mentioned in the policies, providing reasonable accommodations <coughs> and reasonable modifications, administering programs in the most integrated setting appropriate. The ADA is all about non-segregation, engaging in effective communication, ensuring accessibility of programs, facilities, and information communication technology. We mentioned about the websites, very important. So this is carryover in 188. Of course, uh, the, the, uh, turn it over to Commissioner Bershaw. All right, so as uh, Dr. Sisson just highlighted, uh, our America's job centers or career centers are required to um, <clears throat> ensure that individuals with disabilities have equal opportunity to all of the programs, benefits that we offer. Our career centers must provide 
the individuals with the same opportunities as, as others and individuals with disabilities should be served through the same channels as individuals without disabilities um, and using those accommodations that we discussed earlier. This includes access to employment opportunities in all functions of America's job centers, including registration for, the provision of aid, services, training, support services, and any right, privilege, advantage, or opportunity enjoyed by others. Just to highlight equal opportunity, the American uh, job centers are required to ensure effective communication, including uh, auxiliary aids and devices where necessary. We'll talk more in a minute about screen readers, interpreters, video relay. There's a company that we work with just to highlight Sorensen video relay. They're probably the most used in our state. Um, if you contact them, they will actually set that equipment up for you and have it available to individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. America's career, uh, career centers are also to provide program and architectural accessibility and access to information and communication technology. Now we're gonna jump into some actual pictures and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sisson. All right, and so uh, some of these is kind of, think of it as playing where's Waldo, it's up here, where's the barrier? And we talked before about making sure that places of employment and career centers and other program areas are accessible to people with disabilities and welcoming. And if you came in here and you are using a wheelchair and you're down lower, or you are a person of short stature, this countertop is too high. So that's a barrier. Many you'll see have a, have a lower area at the front counter to, to address that problem. And that, that was at a career center. I don't know if that's still like that, but hopefully that's been removed. And this, the next slide shows a, a toilet, and next to the toilet, where somebody in a chair would do a side-to-side -side transfer to the toilet, there's a trash can. So there's examples of temporary barriers, but if you have a significant disability, you may not be able to move that trash can out of the way. Uh, the next uh, slide shows a picture of a door, and it's got the sign on the door. The sign has the, the, the people figures, and it's got a wheelchair symbol on it and that's on the door and it has braille on it and if somebody who's blind was trying to read the braille somebody who opened the door off them, the signage actually needs to be on the last side of the door posted on the wall at a height of 60 inches from the floor to the center of the sign and the uh, and this is one that we've seen at many career centers and this was at a career center and i i'm not going to tell you which one but uh, uh but the access aisle is right on top of the program an access aisle needs to be on a flat level surface for people's lifts from vans to be able to deploy fully. So, and this one is, the next one just a funny picture. Somebody thought it's a, it's a stairwell and next to the stairs, there's a really steep ramp. And uh, this is one, I would, wouldn't even try that. My 39 years of using a wheelchair, I would not try this. I would not recommend <laughs> it. So, and then the next one is, is, it's mostly a good picture of accessibility. There's plenty of room to access the toilet, except the uh, toilet, the flush handles on the wrong side of the toilet. So, and the next one is what's called a standy stall that many people try to try to um, show as a uh, wheelchair accessible. And a wheelchair accessible stall is going to be five feet square. It's going to have enough room, as you saw in one of the prior pictures, so somebody can make a side to side transfer. This is meant for somebody that can stand and get on the toilet, not for a wheelchair user. And then the, uh, the next picture is actually a good example of accessibility. Uh, this is the computer workstation. It has enough room under somebody in a wheelchair to get under the computer. It's got a larger screen. It's got some of the technology. And then the, uh, the next slide is a picture of, of a temporary barrier. It, it's, it's eliminating the clear wall space that somebody in a wheelchair needs to be able to pull the door beside them instead of into themselves. And then uh, the next slide is, that was at a career center, but uh, this one has a, a potted plant next to the toilet. You know, it looks great. It's also mixing an access aisle on the other side of the wall. So those are good examples of pictures um, there. So I'm turning it back over to uh, Commissioner Bershaw.
Yeah, Dr. Sisson and I got a kick out of the potted plant next to the commode. <laughs> All right, let's talk for a second about uh, universal access. Universal access, uh, when you're thinking about how would I use universal access, you would need to understand local needs, marketing and outreach, involve community groups and schools, collaborate with your partners, get some linkages, uh, staff training, intake, registration, orientation, assessments and screening and service delivery. All of these you would need to consider universal access. Well, what does that mean? We use the term in the rehabilitation world, universal design all the time. Uh, that just means it, it's a philosophy of designing products and services that can be used by the widest number of people at one time. Um, this would include products and services that are directly usable uh, without requiring assistive technology and those um, made compatible with assistive technology. Examples would be an automatic door. How many of you have used the button for wheelchairs when you're carrying a box into work? Um, a curb cutout. How many of you have used that when you're taking supplies to your car, when you're using a cart? Um, a higher toilet seat, larger print. Um, all of those that are, of us that are getting a little older can use larger print. So, Universal design, the, the idea is, although you are trying to accommodate individuals with disabilities, anyone can benefit um, from the design concept. Let's talk for a minute about customized employment. A lot of employers are scared of customized employment, but it really is about um, getting your needs met as an employer and meeting the needs of an employee at the same time. Customized employment is negotiating job duties or employee expectations to align the skills and interest of a job seeker with a disability to an employer's needs. This negotiation results in a job description that describes a customized relationship between the employer and employee. Rather than trying to sell employers on the concept of hiring people with disabilities, a lot of times it's better for us to appeal directly to the employer's needs. So we might say, what is it at your business that you, what task do you need to get accomplished? What are you missing? And then we would find an individual with a disability who could complete those specific tasks. We list a website there for you to um, access. Um, let's talk about collaboration and partnership. Establishing partnerships uh, with entities that have experience working with individuals with disabilities. That's why we're in the career centers, our vocational rehabilitation partners. But in the bottom, we list some examples, and not only could you use VR for us to pay for things that uh, the other uh, workforce partners cannot pay for when it works with individuals, when you work with individuals with disabilities, uh, we could access Medicaid to pay for things like personal assistance services on a job site, or uh, TANF through DHR. Funds may be used to pay for after school child care and support. So, in state government, there are a lot of resources, and we have to figure out how to maximize those resources. Um, next, you'll see um, just some tips for you. You need to maintain um, a up to date and have someone update this list regularly of agencies that provide this service. You don't want to wait. Let's say you, you got a list of, of who provides interpreter services for the deaf four years ago. And you never have someone who's deaf walk into the career center until four years later and you haven't updated your list of how to get an interpreter. Uh, those are things you need to be aware of and you need to have staff assigned to keep those lists up to date. Uh, this page just gives you some another resource. Uh, it's called Guideposts for Success. It deals specifically with the delivery of services to youth. Uh, and you can find that on the National Collaborative on Workforce and Disability website. All right. Um, this is just more information uh, as part of the process. Uh, registration. And we mentioned this before, asking all registrants, including individuals with disabilities, whether they need assistance. So you don't spotlight people with disabilities. 
uh, also the staff offer assistance to all individuals, including people with disabilities, filling out forms and application materials. And all customers are routinely offered the option of meeting with staff in private offices. And then also all customers are asked if they will need some form of accommodation or assistance to take full advantage of all the services support. And then of course, intake, using a common intake form for new job seekers that helps establish the eligibility for public benefits and assistance from other partners, um, like adult education literacy authorized under Title II of WIOA and dislocated workers and veterans workforce programs on Title I and other service delivery systems. We mentioned already about state uh, VRHCs and Medicaid, mental health agencies and intellectual and developmental disabilities agencies. And I just want to jump in here, uh, Graham, I know the Workforce Council and the Workforce Board are all very interested in having a common intake form Obviously, uh, if we can use that to inform people of the services and resources that are available to them right when they come in for intake, the more we can inform people, the better. And of course, this, uh, this next slide is a picture. Way in, everybody welcome. It's so somebody in a wheelchair, and the, the way in is a, a, some stairs. So again, we want all your place of businesses and the career center to be welcoming. This is an extreme example of how it would not be. And of course, we already mentioned about um, emergency evacuation being a program that should be made accessible to people with disabilities. You should review your procedures, make sure they address the needs of people with disabilities, including individual mobility, sensory, cognitive, and mental health related impairments. So very important area to, to look at. Now we're going to move into reasonable accommodation. Um, under Section 188, uh, we talk about modifications or adjustments to an application or registration process that enables a qualified individual uh, to be able to benefit from aid, aid, benefit services, and training, which we've already mentioned, or modifications or adjustments that enable a qualified individual to perform the essential functions of a job. And we, we underline that again, because again, we, we want employers to understand we're talking about qualified individuals who can complete tasks with an accommodation. Um, they would receive that service uh, with, and training equal to that provided to a qualified individual without a disability or modification or adjustment that enables that individual to enjoy the same benefits. Employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities to ensure equal access. An employer and an employee should work together to identify the most effective reasonable accommodation through an informal discussion known as the interactive process, whereby the individual is provided the opportunity to articulate their needs and the career center or employer is able to determine how to best meet those needs. We have an interactive process here at the Department of Rehabilitation directly for our employees that work for us. We would be happy to share that with you. We have a form that employees complete with their direct supervisor, and then that is sent to a team made up of Dr. Sisson, who's our ADA coordinator here at the department, um, the division director um, for uh, that person's employee section, and then our HR manager. And those three individuals then determine things like undue hardship, is this reasonable for the employer, is it not reasonable, is it a personal use item, is it not a personal use item. And all that can be done through a very informal process with the employee's input. You should do this as quickly as possible. As soon as you know as an employer or a career center or service provider that someone needs an accommodation, uh, you should try to avoid delays in providing that service as, as much as you can. And in, a, in, in implementing the effective process as we just discussed of providing that uh, will ensure equal access. Uh, you want to have the list in an accessible format of all currently available assistive technology devices and services 
An example would be that you would say that VCRs or DVD players and TV monitors have closed captioning. That Zoom text has been installed on available computers. If you have a resource room at your uh, place of employment or at a career center, you wanna make sure that a person who has a disability knows which computers have the uh, appropriate technology for them to use. For deaf and hard of hearing, let's just talk specifically about them for a moment. Um, qualified interpreters would need to be on site or you could use video relay. For many employers and for many service providers, it is not reasonable to have a sign language interpreter on site. However, it is reasonable for you to have video relay service, which would be free to use. Um, Real-time computer-aided transcription services, written materials and notes, open and closed captioning or real-time captioning, which are two different things, <laughs> voice, text, and video-based uh, telecommunications and video text displays. We have some other, uh, some of the other, the next several slides deal more with effective communication also. And again, the individual disability determines which communication method should be used. Um, designated staff should receive uh, training on how to use a TTY and the telephone relay service uh, to make receive calls and to make sure that the, the TTYs are maintained in good working order and that there's test calls on a periodic basis to make sure they're working. And again, if you have courtesy telephones, you want to make sure that there, there's an alternative portable uh, TTY or texting device for public use. And um, and if the if you do if you do make such equipment available, you want to post a notice at the location where those phones are, advising public and how the equipment may be used. And then of course, uh, the next slide gives you uh, more information for people uh, effective communication for folks who are blind or vision impaired, qualified readers, tape, text, audio recording, braille materials, and displays screen reader software, we mentioned that with respect to websites, magnification software, optical readers, secondary auditory programs or SAP, large print materials, uh, Jane Elizabeth uh, Birdshaw mentioned that, uh, other effective methods of making visually delivered materials available. And again, if, the, if you have a video library for public use, the videos purchased are available with audio descriptions. And Dr. Sess, if I could just jump in for a sure, second and sure. just say this is really an exhaustive list for each of these disability groups. We, we don't expect employers or service providers to have all of these. We, we're just giving you a list of some of the possibilities for accommodating each group. Great point, great point. Uh, another slide on effective communication for people with uh, intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, some strategies to be used are allowing extra uh, a time for the police forms, written instructions, or having your uh, employees offer assistance, um, repeating instructions, providing information in a slower voice, and using simple sentences and words, and using graphics or symbols and pictures. Uh, also, your employees may provide a quiet environment for individuals to read materials uh, that, that is fraction free. Uh, of course, more information on effective communication in the next slide. Uh, for individuals with mobility impairments, uh, you could use um, your staff members put themselves at the wheelchair user's eye level or if possible sit next to the customer and have a conversation. Providing a clipboard to use a writing surface if the counters or reception desks are too high as in that picture that we showed you uh, earlier. Um, and then of course, come around to the customer side of the desk or counter during the interaction. Providing seating if long lines uh, for uh, services are, are happening and the person can't stand for long periods of time. Uh, ensuring that the physical location of the program is accessible for people who use wheelchairs or other mobility devices. Uh, take stairs, uh, consideration stairs, the, uh, the steepness of slopes and the width of doors. And if the individual is unable to access a program, uh, staff offers to meet them and offer in offices that are accessible. We mentioned that before, we talked about program access. And of course, uh, 
further ways for effective communication for people with speech impairments. Um, if a person doesn't understand, if a staff member doesn't understand what somebody's saying, he or she shouldn't pretend to understand. And instead, the staff person asks the, the customer to repeat what he or she said, and then repeats it back to them. And also, employees could uh, ask questions that require only short answers or nod the head. Or um, if if, first, if a staff member has difficulty understanding the individual, he or she considers having the individual write or sit at a computer screen as an alternative, but first ask the individual if that's acceptable. Uh, then, of course, the next slide, we've given you a, a website to access a link, which is a great resource for increasing communications access. If I could jump in for just a second and, and give a couple of examples um, for those of you who are not as familiar with disability. When we talk about someone with a speech impairment, it, it could be as simple as stuttering, or it could be as complex as someone with ALS or CP, uh, or uh, a disability that um, impacts neuromuscular capabilities. And so um, sometimes that individual will not have any cognitive impairment, but they will have difficulty getting their message across to you. And so you have to take these, um, adjustments into consideration. Another example would be when you go back to intellectual disability or developmental disability, and you're talking about individuals possibly with autism or other diagnoses who um, could benefit from employment but may not be able to uh, complete that initial application packet like everyone else would be able to complete it. However, with what we call social stories or picture cues, they could be taught task of the job um, and complete that job satisfactorily. Thank you. All right, and the last part of our presentation is, is on disability awareness and etiquette. Um, the, the central thing in disability etiquette is making eye contact with any person with a disability. Speaking to the person with a disability directly, not speaking to the person that's with the person with a disability, that's what that person needs or want. Again, in spite of all these little uh, terms of etiquette that were mentioned today, don't be afraid of people with disabilities or people first. And statistically, uh, people with disabilities are 20% of the population. In Alabama, 31.5% of the population has some type of disability. People with disabilities are the largest minority, and disability is an equal part of diversity. Um, why care? And uh, I like the story of TABS, and TABS is not the nasty diet drink my grandmother drank during the 70s, not what you pull off of the loom and can, means temporarily able-bodied. In fact, everybody without a disability is a tab, temporarily able-bodied. And a uh, way to think about this is, you know, disability can happen to anybody in an instant. So you might not have a disability now, but you could have one in the future. The greatest risk factor for disability is age. If you live long enough, you will acquire some type of disability. We mentioned these, this is important. These are what we call the great perspective. You understand those things, how common disability is because of these factors. Uh, it's, it's something that, why we should give importance to it because it's likely to occur. And then of course, um, offering assistance. Um, before helping somebody with a disability, ask him or her, don't be upset if somebody turns down your help. I had a friend who was crossing the street behind the, the state capitol, and he, he used a wheelchair, and uh, he had a higher level of injury paralysis, and he, he was not able to push his wheelchair as well. A Capitol police officer came behind him and just started pushing his wheelchair without asking. And at the very end, just as he was about to cross the road, the Capitol police officer pushed him the rest of the way and let go of his wheelchair, and he flipped over backwards and broke his neck again and was not able to work anymore. And if he had asked ahead of time the Capitol Police officer, he would have said, look, before you let go of my wheelchair, let me know so I can regain control. And it's not that the Capitol Police officer did anything wrong. It was just that it's one of those things you need to ask everybody how they, all, how they can be helped, and they'll tell you. So in the next slide, um, Fancy rules on what should you call somebody with a disability. This is a cartoon that shows 
uh, a woman speaking to a guy in a wheelchair and she says, what should I call you? Should I call you handicapped, physically challenged, disabled, and said, Joe would be fine. Yeah. So oftentimes the best, the best uh, name to call somebody with disabilities is one their parents gave. So, and then of course, um, turn this over. All right, so earlier we mentioned people first language. Uh, let's talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. What does that mean? It simply means a person is a person first. An example would be Dr. Sisson is a person with a disability. He is not a disabled person. We don't use language like handicapped person anymore. Uh, we don't say uh, it, it just it has its origins with people who were beggars. Uh, other words to avoid, we don't say cripple anymore, invalid, wheelchair bound. I hear a lot of news stations who say someone is wheelchair bound. Uh, no, they're a person who uses a wheelchair, uh, confined to a wheelchair, etc. More words to avoid. People who try and work really hard do not say the wrong thing and they say someone's differently abled or challenged, able-bodied, special, gimp, gimpy, afflicted, suffering from. These would all be terms that you want to try and avoid. Um, and, and what we call just plain dumb is someone saying handy capable. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes people try too hard. Um, but just know, um, some young people, uh, it's like with other special populations are beginning to claim terms that were sometimes seen as negative. And so one of those terms is disabled and young people may not take offense. Whereas someone who is older, um, a person with a disability who's older may, uh, may take offense to it. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, they, and um, let's move to the next slide. Political correctness. Um, just know that if in doubt, ask, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, is, it, is it political correctness for us to use people first language? No, it's just about creating reasonable expectations for individuals with disabilities. People with disabilities should not be defined by their disability, just as you would not want to be defined by one singular characteristic. There's a caveat. Please don't avoid speaking to someone with a disability out of the fear of saying something wrong. They'll let you know. <laughs> An example, uh, okay, it's okay to say to a person with a visual impairment, I'll see you later. I have seen some folks uh, talk with my friends here who work with me who are blind and they say something like, see you later, and then they gasp because they realize they've said, see you later to a blind person. Uh, it's okay to say that. Um, many people, just like many other folks, have a sense of humor. Um, other words to avoid, someone is, a person is deaf, but they are not deaf and dumb. Mental health issues, there are a lot of people who have hid disabilities, particularly mental health, which carries a lot of stigma to it. Um, and typically mental illness and psychiatric disability terms are used interchangeably and some groups and individuals prefer one or the, or the other. Um, a possible alternative to this would be someone has mental health issues. And we're getting close to the end, so bear with us. <laughs> um, do not assume that people with psychiatric disabilities are more dangerous or more violent. A lot of times people hear certain psychiatric disabilities and they're concerned that their employee is gonna, you know, uh, what, what's that terminology, go postal in yes. a business. <laughs> uh, you know, don't assume the worst um, because it's just simply not true. Um, particularly if that individual is regulated on psychotropic medications uh, with, the, um, with doctor's input. Uh, if you have doubts, again, just ask the person with a disability. Some myths, uh, all people with disabilities get together and they all know each other. That's not true. Uh, all people with disabilities do not know uh, everyone else. Disability is contagious. No, disease is contagious. Disability is not. 
um, people with disabilities are superheroes. Oh, they're so inspirational. You know, avoid that if you can. And people with disabilities only want to live off the government. Uh, many people with disabilities typically want to work and they want to work, but they don't want to lose insurance possibly given to them through a service like Alabama Medicaid or Medicare. It's not about wanting to keep a benefit other than a person needing health insurance because they have a disability. We're going to show you a quick video and wrap up. Good morning, Bob. Good morning there. Big man. Morning, Alice! There's no need to be awkward. Poor Bob. Like so many of us, he just doesn't know how to interact with people with disabilities. It's pretty easy, really. People with disabilities are people first. We need the same things that every person needs, like respect. Good morning, everyone. Attention! Uh, okay. Maybe we need to be more specific. The easiest way to show respect is to focus on the person, not the disability. It's okay. You'll get the hang of it. One easy way to focus on the person is to watch the person signing and not their interpreter. Or their companion. It's really cool that you'd like to help, but do us both a favor and please ask me first. What you think might be helping? I got you. Wait, wait, ah! Oh no, might actually not. If you'd like to offer me help, let me hold on to your elbow. Don't take mine. Hey, would you like to take my arm? Sure. Assistive devices help us to live our lives. They're really important and really personal. Grabbing them only makes it weird for everyone. What? Please only touch our devices and service animals if we've given you permission. And don't take it personally if I ask you not to. Remember that my service animal helps me all the time. Neither of us would like it if we were separated. Remember, we make our own decisions. We sign documents, vote, volunteer, work, and pay taxes. We get married. So don't touch me just because I have a great smile. Just because I'm blind. May I help you? Does not mean I'm deaf. Just because I'm deaf doesn't mean I'm blind. And just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that I can't sweep you off your feet. So take a deep breath, relax. We don't bite. Unless we're really hungry. Hello, ladies. How are you? Hello. And if you're not sure what to do, just ask. Hi, would you still like to see a menu? Uh, no thanks, but can you please read it to me? Sure, definitely. Just treat us the way you would want to be treated, and we'll all be okay. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Alice. Good morning. Awkward no more. Nice job, Bob. Go forth and be human. There's no need to be awkward. Uh, disability is a natural part of the human experience, and people with disabilities want to fully contribute as members of society. Um, remember to think about those myths that we talked about earlier um, when working with individuals with disabilities. Uh, remember that your receptionist is your first line of defense. Make sure that your receptionist knows basics about disability etiquette. If you would like for us at the Department of Rehabilitation to come and train your staff, we will be happy to do so. Please reach out to us. The main thing is let's just work together. Um, 
employers in Alabama need employees. There are people with disabilities who want to work. So let's figure out how to work together to provide the services that individuals with disabilities need to go to work. We've made a great start. Let's keep moving forward. Uh, there are references in our PowerPoint. And again, if you have questions, our contact information was on that first slide. Please feel free to, free to reach out to us. And uh, thank you so much for having us today. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murdershaw uh, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Sisson. We uh, really appreciate those comments. That's uh, with the fact that we are short of skilled labor in this state, as, as bad as we are. We certainly need to look at all avenues. And uh, the disabled are an area that a lot of people uh, in business shy away from, probably because of the uh, American Disabilities Act. They're scared of, of not complying, but I think with y'all as a resource, be a terrific resource for industries to reach out to. We appreciate your time with us this morning, and hopefully people listening to the video will reach out and ask for your help. Thank you so much for being with us. Now I'm gonna turn the uh, meeting over to Nick Moore from the Governor's Office of Education and Workforce Transformation. Nick. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chairman McCartney, and to Commissioner Burdishaw and Dr. Sisson. Really appreciate you giving us an update about things we can all do to make sure that we're spreading awareness and access for those that have a disability. Um, I will ask if Chris has, has a way to uh, pull up my slides. We'll go ahead and share those. So we're, I'm gonna give you just a couple of very brief updates about some ongoing initiatives that involve all of our business and industry stakeholders today. So go to the next slide, Chris. So right now, um, I'll encourage everyone who may be listening to go and register your credentials with the uh, Alabama Credential Registry. So you can go onto the ACHE website and there, there's the portal is right there. If you've got any questions about this, you can reach directly out to me by email and I'll connect you with the right folks. Uh, but right now, we have got our credential registry open between now and November. You can register any credential cer certification that your company requires uh, for a particular job. And the reason why we want to do this is because we're going to, uh, as I'll show you, we can just go on to the uh, skip to two slides. All right. So this uh, initiative that we've joined recently called Skillful is about developing competency and skill based job descriptions. So the reason why we want you to register those credentials is because over the next year, we're gonna be doing a big effort to try to get folks the ability to make a skill-based job description. What that means is that rather than just plugging in, well, you gotta have a four-year degree, you gotta have a two-year degree, or, or some skill statements that are not specific, we're gonna be looking at this from a pretty clinical or, or at least empirical sense to say, here's the actual skill statement that lines up with a particular credential and that goes with this particular job. So that an employer makes a skill-based job description and then can get a class of candidates for that job that's directly aligned with the job description. So let's go back one slide, uh, Chris. All right, so also we joined recently, last month, the Recovery and Reskilling Network through NGA. This is interesting because all those states you see highlighted in purple, we're working with them on some of the initiatives that they're doing right now and try to upskill, reskill people. I can tell you we're right in line with what just about every other state's doing, which is focusing on getting people who have been displaced in less resilient sectors, more public facing, taking the opportunity now to reskill them, get them into a more self-sustaining career pathway. Um, so we're going to keep learning and, and hopefully we'll, we'll uh, have an opportunity to scale that with uh, the grant that I'm going to talk about here in just a second. So let's go forward two slides. Now, something else that's very interesting that we're going to be talking about uh, comprehensively on the 16th of September at our next Combined Workforce Day, we've developed a tool with the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta called David Dashboard for Alabamians to Visualize Income Determinations. Um, and David is going to be important to help people become self-sufficient because a lot of people face a benefit cliff. We've talked about this in the past 
to where your short-term interests are against your long-term interests. In the short term, if you go to work, you lose several benefits, child care, SNAP, TANF, insurance. Um, and so what we want to do is show people what, what, how much are you going to lose and then what programs are out there trying to make you whole so that your short-term interests don't get in the way of your long-term interests. Slide, please. All right, so the, uh, another thing that we've done, and I know that uh, Chairman McCartney mentioned this a little bit, is try to survey the underemployed and unemployed in the state. And, try, and this is similar to what Strata, some of you may have seen what the Strata Education Network has done recently, to try to figure out what are the interests and aptitudes of those who have been displaced by COVID-19, and what are the type of education and training programs they'd like to enroll in. We're going to show you all of the data in our next time together. But just one interesting data point was that a plurality, this, you know, I know it's not a majority here, but a plurality of respondents would prefer to enroll in a short certificate program in the next six months. So this is in line with what we're seeing nationally that in this COVID-19 environment, people want short term programs and they want programs that aren't going to put them in debt. Next slide, please. Okay, so just a little bit of an update on, on uh, COVID-19. We've got a lot of good trends going on right now compared to last month. Uh, the total number of confirmed cases in Alabama is just over 100,000, and we've got nearly 2,000 deaths as of August 20th. But the cases have slowed markedly since July 19th when as a daily average, we had over 1,851 cases um, as the rolling average. Now it's down to 855, so that's a 54% drop. We've also had the lowest amount of people hospitalized since early July, and the percentage of positive tests has gone down from 16.5% of all tests to just over uh, seven. So these are all good trends, but we certainly should not let our guard down now as a lot of these decreases have been the result of the governor's mask order. Uh, everybody who has done a good job making sure that we're complying with social distancing and facial covering uh, requirements. And also just the big box retailers of Walmarts and CBSs of the world who have also put in mask orders. So uh, hopefully we'll see those trends continue. Next slide, please. Something else that has come up recently, a lot of people have questions on is the lost wage assistance program. So on August 8th, the president issued four executive actions on COVID-19. One was an, a, a memo that creates this lost wage assistance program, which is essentially taking funds from the FEMA disaster relief fund and uh, creating a enhanced unemployment compensation payment since the additional $600 under the CARES Act ceased on July 31st. So states had two options. You could either do $300 federal payment and a $100 state payment. Could have came from the coronavirus relief fund or just whatever state funds you had. Um, so that would give everybody an additional $400. Everybody that qualified under the CARES Act, including the pandemic unemployment assistance for people who didn't normally qualify for UI, would qualify under this. The second option, which is what Alabama chose to do, is to give an additional $300 payment that's a federal payment and then use your state unemployment um, funds that are already going at. So we do 275 a week. So that counts as our federal match. So our state match. So our uh, claimants will get additional 300. Um, it's guaranteed for about three weeks. And then after that, it will be uh, just seeing how much is left. There's 44 billion and it goes down to 25 billion, then it will uh, program will cease. Our application was approved on Friday the 21st. Next slide, please. Reimagining workforce prep grant. Uh, so as you saw from the survey results, people are interested in short-term programs. They're interested in upskilling into more resilient sectors. And so just today we submitted a $20 million proposal to the U.S. Department of Education that would scale programs that would do just that, Alabama Workforce Stabilization Program and Advanced Manufacturing Healthcare, 
IT, transportation, distribution, logistics, and construction. This would also set people up to have a longer term career pathway because it's focused on low income adults who don't have a high school diploma. So by completing this program, they would qualify for something called the ability to benefit program that would allow them to continue on towards a long-term certificate or associate or bachelor's degree. Um, so we're looking to serve about uh, almost 8,000 people over three years. It's also going to have a focus on wraparound supports and services and make sure that they persist. Everybody in the program will earn a credential and there'll also be a work-based learning requirement. It's meant to get people rapidly uh, upskilled and, and retrained. So, fingers crossed and everybody say a little pray for us on, on that. But even if we don't get the grant, we're gonna continue rolling that program out with some state assets that we have. Next slide, please. All right, uh, we're also gonna send out the updated education workforce COVID-19 memo. Uh, so that'll be posted on Alabama Works. And that's all I've got, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate that update. Uh, as you know, uh, we, we're going to have a drawing for the gift card, $500 gift card for those respondents to the uh, uh, survey that Nick was referring to. Uh, but since our meeting, since our uh, today is not the end of August, we're going to defer that drawing until September. So continue to submit those responses through the August 31st. The more data, the better. Uh, like, like Nick said, we've already got some preliminary data uh, and that's helping us uh, develop the programs we need to do. But we will do the drawing and, and, and uh, announce the winner at our next uh, webinar. The webinars we have on, uh, online for the next, uh, next ones are, if I can find my list, we have dates of September 21st and then October 19th, November 16th and December 14th. Uh, agenda and speakers will be announced uh, prior to the webinars uh, by email and social media and we'll, we'll post these dates on the uh, Alabama Works website. So uh, one other thing uh, I thought Nick was going to mention, but I'm going to clean up here, is uh, just came to our attention that Governor Ivey has, uh, is issuing a proclamation declaring September as the Alabama Workforce Development Month. So be aware of that. We'll post that proclamation on alabamaworks.com as soon as we get a copy as well. So unless there's other business to attend to, Nick, do you have anything? No, sir. I appreciate our, our guests and learned a lot today. Thank you. All right. Thanks again to Commissioner Bernershaw and, and uh, Dr. Sisson. We appreciate their information. It'll be very useful to, uh, in our jobs. Thanks again, and we'll see you on the 21st of September.